uh, but Paul Maroka has been the artist in residence at Tuba Mock Hill for at least a decade and probably more. I shared with you oh. all his, <laughs> I shared with you all his um, bio and some other links to his history up at the Hill. He'll review uh, that as well as challenge our way of looking at uh, nature uh, through a science lens as well as through the lens of an artist. And, um, you know, without much more, I think, Paul, I'm going to hand it over to you to um, share what you have with all of us. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Trika. Um, this is um, this is a draft of something that I'm putting putting together. It was 2011 when I started on the tomb on the hill here, so I, I'm putting together a, a larger report that I hope to make into like a self-published book um, and donate to the make a few copies and donate it to the Tuamark Library. So it is kind of a work in progress. And there was so much stuff that I'm kind of focusing on photography and most of the drawing and, and other kinds of stuff. There's a little bit of, of writing, photography, and drawing that I've done here. Uh, I'm going to mainly talk about some of the ideas that um, I've worked on here. So considering that um, this is really an executive summary, I'll talk a little bit about Humboldt. Humboldt, Spalding, and Turner, kind of my um, the three mentors that I've tapped into as inspiration, as scientific inspiration for the work I've been doing here. So Humboldt, Turner, Humboldt, Spalding to Turner, it's, it's like a uh, double play combination. So it goes, the, the ball goes from Humboldt short stop to second base, Spalding, first base, Turner. So it's kind of the way I think of, of how there's a lot of knowledge and ideas get passed along from generation to generation. Those people are all of a previous generation and we're trying to carry on um, ideas. And a lot of the artistic ideas that I work with came from scientists. Um, so what I wanted to say is put questions since I'm putting this together as I go, as I speak, put questions in the chat and um, Trika, could you just, when there's a pause or when I forget what I'm trying to say, just ask a question and, and we can have some conversations in between these slides. Exactly, yeah. So you can either raise your hand, put a message in the chat and I'm paying attention and I will um, find a pause to um, interject and ask Paul. I mean, otherwise, I feel like it's sort of like uh, my family vacation, and here I'm showing my my you know sl slides, and um, the, I'm going to just be touching on ideas. Like I said, it's executive summary. You know, if if I could send something up to Humboldt, it's sort of like I, I want to get um, a pass fail grade because I've used a lot of his ideas. So I'm touching on points. So I'm not going to really dwell on anything. So that's why I want you to ask questions and that will help me kind of find out what kind of things you're interested in. So, I mean, it's 10 years and each of the things that I talk about could be its own talk. And so I can elaborate on anything that seems of, of more interest. Um, so I report to Ben obviously right now, but I, I have a little bit, I feel responsible to acknowledge me, maybe or um, make some sort of a report to the mentors of the past whose ideas I've tried to carry along. And um, it's uh, really what I'm gonna talk about is how art relates to science, how art can, and how science um, can maybe relate to art, how those things interact. Um, for me, they, react, they interact extremely easily. I, went to art school. I, I spent 30 years as a science illustrator. And I grew up hanging around my dad's lab. He was a plant pathology professor. And I'm just used to hanging around scientists and um, they're, they're familiar to me. Um, 
But in the larger culture, these um, two fields don't really fit together. Um, in some ways they do, but there's, um, there's friction. So as an artist coming up to a historical, kind of a pretty much an iconic field station, um, there's certain things that just came to mind that um, didn't go together, but I decided um, this is a place-based, I just, this, I'm not the first person to do place-based artwork. It's all been done before, but I have my own um, train of thought where I had to sort of reinvent all of this. So um, I try to keep things that didn't go together in my mind without trying to answer any of the questions and just let these things kind of interact as I just went ahead and did whatever occurred to me and whatever interested me. So to get back to um, maybe boots on the ground, we have 1,500 to 2,000 walkers coming up the hill every day. And you know what brings them here? It's not really, it's the, not the science, to some, of them, to some people it is, but what brings them here? There's um, exercise, there's socializing, but we don't really know what's going on in their minds. There, there is some kind of a, a mysterious force that draws people up under the hill. And I think that um, part of that is the landscape and it's something that people aren't aware of. There's sort of a subliminal sense of being in nature that I wanna explore a little bit. And I want to show how maybe how not necessarily how an artist, but how me, somebody who calls themselves an artist, explores a place sort of from ground zero, from from scratch, from nothing, because I really started from nothing here. And that possibly some of those ideas or feelings or ways of noticing, ways of, of paying attention um, could be useful in transferring that somehow to the, to the population that comes up here. So to me, art is a way of paying extreme, very detailed, very impeccable attention to something. And that's how you become connected to it. Um, one of the things I found about scientists is that they do the same thing. And I'm gonna kind of start with that. Um, so I made it, uh, since 2011, I made my creative challenge was to do only work on Tuamak. So if I saw a photograph or something to draw, sometimes I cheated, I didn't do it. I only draw it, I only worked on Tuamak. I wanted to do all the work on site and just stick with one kind of one thing. As it turned out, I did, I stuck with too many things and became like, you'll see, this is just a little small fragment of all the things that I've done. Now, let me just see. So Paul, uh, yeah. Mr. Tariq, I just want you to know that I'm not seeing your screen share at this point. I'm You're only not? seeing you. No, before you had uh, your uh, other it's, uh, screen up. Yes, right why now. is only that? Um, you can't Trika, see I'm it. Seeing it. I was seeing it also. Yeah, we're seeing it. It's just you, Trika. Just me? Are you seeing the big well, yep. are you seeing the pyramid? Big triangle? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Well, it's only okay. So, okay, so I don't know. Look up on the view up at the upper right hand corner and see if you got the wrong view. Well, uh, I don't think I have the wrong view, but yeah. So if that, I, I it just popped up, but I didn't change anything. I'm going to so try not to touch it, anything myself because um, you never so know. If anyone else. Um, is only seeing Paul's uh, picture. Don't look no, at me. Look at the look at the triangle. I put mine set yeah, on I side by it. side yeah. speaker view, and then um, also right between the speaker and the slides, there's a little thing you can slide it to the right to make Paul's ugly mug look a lot smaller and his beautiful slides look a lot bigger. Yeah. I mean, I did, I did my best, Larry. I, I, I turned on like the touch up the face um, <laughs> filters on Zoom, but you know. We should I, have done I, a beach in Hawaii. I think a, beach, a beach in Hawaii might have helped for a background. Yeah, well, <laughs> next time, next time I'll do that. All right, does so everybody see this? Um, this is one of the few uh, slides with type on it that I'll show, but. Um, just let me just 
let me know that you see the big triangle. Yeah, I can see it, Paul. Okay. I can see it. If you, so, if I can you see it. Uh, put it. I can see it. All right, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to start out with the punchline. This is what I came up with. And then I'm going to start from zero and kind of get here. But I just want to make a few things, a um, few points here, and then show how um, some of these <laughs> ideas came to me. Um, this obviously is borrowed from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And um, I say the lowest level is artist illustrates scientists publication. It's what I did for uh, many decades. There's not that much interaction. The scientists might say, you know, you've got to fix this. You've got too many hairs on that ant's abdomen or something like that. Um, and that's, that's one very valid um, interaction between art and science. The artist is, is employee of the scientist in a sense, and, um, or a consultant uh, in my case. Next level is basically what I'm mostly, this slideshow is gonna be about. The artist incorporates or is inspired by scientific ideas and especially um, scientists work of the past and it, it's integrated, you do artwork based on um, all the cool stuff. Like to me, um, science is a huge, a, a, an infinite database of interesting ideas and visual things. And um, just like a cornucopia of stuff that, that I naturally can funnel, funnel into art. Now, other artists sometimes like that stuff and it fits into the whole genre of art and the whole language of how, how artists talk to each other. but. As I found, um, scientists are often very uninterested in this kind of stuff. Um, you go up another level and the, the, the artist is exploring you know, scientific work, maybe along with the scientists, but there's a, there's a lot of data in the world, huge amount of data that scientists are not interested in and they ignore because they're not relevant. I find a, artists and, and I find a lot of that stuff interesting. Um, for instance, um, some of most of the stuff that I'm showing you will, will, will be some of that stuff. The highest, uh, the pinnacle, I've never reached this. And um, I really haven't even gone very, very far into getting the scientists to be interested. In fact, almost every, almost very little of what I've done, I've never shown any of it to the scientists. And when I've done, so they have been uninterested. And except for a few people where I took their portraits and um, they used some things for, for some of the slideshows and things, but I'm not complaining about it. It's the way it's, it's but there's been very little interaction between the scientists and the artists um, on Tulamak. But I wanna to get to this pinnacle part. Um, scientists and artists are equal collaborators. That's somewhere where like, um, I have a big interest in the Spalding plots and the, the soil plots and all the data that's been um, collected there. And I went along in 2012 with the, the um, soil survey that was done every 10 years and with all the spawning plots and permanent plots and the vegetation plots there. And I, I, I'm kind of fascinated with that. And I'd like to do some artwork with all that data, um, something that would actually maybe bring something to notice to the scientists that they didn't notice but would also um, be interesting to other people and be interesting to artists. So something, that, the ideal to me is in a sentence, creating something that nobody can tell whether it's science or art. The scientists think that it's science and maybe it shows them something that they didn't notice about their own data. And the artists and other people just say, yeah, that's art. And to me, it's like, I don't really know what it is. I don't care what it is, but it's something that's interesting about the world and shows you something, makes you notice something new and more about the world. So in essence, I don't care that much about art. I really care about noticing things in the world and an artist is sort of a tool for that. I don't actually identify as an artist so much as I used to. Um, let's go into um, one example uh, is Leonardo da Vinci. He's hit that pinnacle so many times um, right on target. This is a little sketch he did of that scientists are very familiar with um, of how the, the, the area of a branching 
remains the same. The cross section of each branch in, in each successive branching um, pattern remains the same, which makes sense because there's vascular um, tissues in there and there's a flow going on and you can't have a interruption in that flow. There's also many other factors, but this, um, this idea called Leonardo, Leonardo's rule, it came up um, last January when we did a uh, two, two mark art and science workshop with um, Brian Enquist at the EEB department who's studying this. And he gave, he literally in his lecture, he said, this all came from Leonardo da Vinci, an artist. Scientists have picked up on this idea and he's using, um, basically this is a fractal um, Leonardo, in order to draw trees, he realized that he had to, um, that the branches had to work this way, that the thickness of the branches had to, of each branch, say in the first circle, the second, had to equal the branches that it came from. So um, each daughter branch um, works in a certain, along a certain fractal kind of pattern, which there's a mathematics that's been built up since the fractal um, since Metal Broad invented fractals, whenever that was. And he can use this um, to, in this fascinating way, to model using fractal geometry and math, to model um, whole forests or whole trees and the nutrients um, intake or uptake of say carbon, uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen and, and things within a forest and analyze that and scientist in a scientific kind of way. And so, um, a fascinating uh, art. I, I did the drawing part of that. I drew a fractal tree and I did a, I showed a, a bunch of um, the way after he did his lecture, I drew some fractal trees and drew a Palo Verde tree and sort of showed how um, some of those fractals are useful for drawing the tree. So it was such a satisfying thing that um, I was able to do some real art kind of work and then in between stuff that I didn't know what it was. It was just sort of analyzing how trees grow that also made sense um, to science. So when I came here, this was the question, what should an artist do at a historic science field station, especially a famous one like Tubamak? And I didn't have any idea. Um, my, my, another mentor of mine is Gary Nabhan and he just um, told me one day, hey, you, there might be some office space up on Tubamak. And I didn't apply for anything. And I went up there and um, they gave me some keys in an office space. It turned out that it was a, pretty much of a ghost town. All the artists, I mean, all of the scientists have moved out. So I guess uh, artists move in when everyone else moves out. But it was actually like a, a very wonderful opportunity to do some exploration. And um, what Gary told me, my job was really just to draw maybe near the road where people could see and maybe have some interaction with the people that were walking the hill and um, possibly make a poster, he says. The poster I have not done yet, but I have a bunch of ideas. Um, but what he did tell me is he had been a writer in residence at the um, Oregon State University Andrews Forest. And he was really impressed with this. Um, Tumamak is now uh, on this network of long-term ecological reflection. So there's this LTER, a network of science field stations that have some artists and writers associated with them. And uh, I can give you the website for the um, Andrews Forest, but these are just the fundamental beliefs. And so I started with this, paying close attention to one place. That's what I decided to do. And study the place for a long time over generations. Well, that Tumamak has already been doing that, and I'm just the next generation. And uh, poetry and mathematics, let's say you could call it literary work, humanities work, mathematics, and um, quantitative science, uh, both authentic, maybe equal win windows on the world, just seen it from a different lens, but equally. Um, hopefully, if we get to the top of that triangle, hopefully like equal as partners. So there's, there's a big richness in the community of art and science. And um, that's, that's why um, I'm talking about this and advocating for um, conversations to be happening between the two. And 
like I said about the walkers, there's insights to be gained from how we live our life. My life's been totally changed from the work that I've done on Tumamak. And artists naturally want to uh, share that with other people. And the, ideally people all just explore on Tumamak on their own, but possibly artists can open up other ways of seeing and show people something that they can, um, you can start anywhere on the hill. It doesn't matter where you start. You see one thing that an artist might draw or, or paint and you say, I never saw that before. And once you start looking at one thing, you're gonna see more things and then more and more things because you'll see that everything's connected to everything else. So here's the magic number. Um, I, I'm focusing on photography here just because I haven't had time to get to the, all the drawings and the, and the field books and it would take more than the hour that I have here. But 27,712, that's how many photographs I have in my Lightroom archive. And I've gone through all of those in the last um, few uh, months when I've been thinking on this, about this project. And what I basically have to say about it is 99% of that was complete crap. Like I wouldn't show it to anybody Yet, um, it, was, it was really interesting and instructive for me, myself, to look at it. And what I, there's a, several things that I learned from it. Um, but for some reason, I've come to this slide and I'm just gonna start here because this is one of the first images. I, most of those images were multiple things, things that I just put together. Very few of, a lot of the things were just not single images, but many images put together and, um, Here's one example. I don't know if it's going to show well in Zoom. But this is a sequence of like about 20 slides just put together that shows what I was looking at. Get him. There go, Pi. You get him. Huh? So, to, so I'm going to get into Humboldt in, in a minute. And this sort of symbolizes the this idea of making a portrait of a place that I was inspired about. So like to make a portrait of a place or a landscape, the way you'd make a portrait of a person, um, you don't really know, there's somebody you could live with for years, you don't really know them until you started trying to make a portrait of them because it makes you notice things that you just um, looked at, you know, never really looked at. You saw, you looked at it, but you never really saw that person. So how would you make a portrait of a place? Um, you just start looking around. Um, you notice, I noticed there's some relation between saguaros and, and clouds. Maybe only just because the saguaros, when I'm photographing them, the clouds, they sort of stick up into the clouds. And I started making connections that, that this first summer there was saguaro fruits on the, on the cactus. And I, and I was making connections with the indigenous uh, ideas of the connection between rain and the saguaro fruit. But, but, but making a portrait of a place, um, you, you have to spend a lot of time on the site, like weeks, years, and months, maybe before you do anything good. Um, I also realized looking at all this, all these pictures I had, the very cliched pictures of saguaro, saguaro flowers, and birds, and and all of this stuff, I had to get through all of that before all of the cliched stuff before I could get anything that was actually would be interesting to me later on. And anything that would be, nothing that would not be interesting to me later on would be interesting to anybody else. So there's a big gap between exploring a place, taking a lot, a lot, a lot of images and just throwing them away and then get into something that's actually interesting to somebody else. This is sort of a, Another image from So I, I was going to talk over this, but I don't think I can. Um, I 
I spent a lot of time uh, just look, watching the rain fall and um, looking at things and, and putting images together that, that kind of were animated. And I, I ended up with um, this particular image, which was inspired by botanical plates. Um, they often had black backgrounds like this and they were hung in classrooms. And um, the black background was a very aesthetic thing for bringing out um, subject. And I was watching this all happen, the different, the different stages of the soil, buds, flowers, fruit, and then the, the fruit degenerating. Um, there, so in this sense, this was all done on a scanner. And I wanted to make the, the, the most detailed um, botanical data. I wanted to have all the botanical detail that I could and yet have, have an aesthetic element. Um, you can actually see the little red velvet mite that's down there. I happen to see those mites. Um, being up here during the, uh, mostly by myself, nobody was really up here, but during the monsoons, it was, it was just really, really dramatic. And I saw things that I had never seen before because just because I could walk out the door and see it, which was actually one of the reasons that the early scientists said that they built these uh, labs on the hill instead of being in town where they would have to drive to their study sites. They said, I can just walk out the door even when it's really hot, 106 degrees, and I can, I can see things that I've never seen before. These little velvet mites just come in and they swarm out during the, um, during the monsoons. And th there's this connection like, like with the flowering of the saguaros and the monsoons that goes deeply into um, Native American uh, mythologies. And it's like the, um, the red, you know, the, um, the autumn, as I've read in Gary's books, um, paint the bottoms of their feet red so that when they fall down drunk drinking the saguaro wine, the red color is, is thought to just bring the rain. So I'm, I'm looking at just the red colors and all these are all saguaro fruits that were collected underneath a single cactus out by the, by the lab. I noticed how they're all like, they all dry out in a different kind of geometry. And um, just watching the saguaro fruits with the red, um, peeling open and just sitting there like within several weeks the rain starts to come and it and it almost I actually believe that there's some connection there just from spending the time watching the, the sky somehow responds to the red swallow fruit that opens up and, and, it, and it starts to um, create these gigantic energetic storms. So again, I was trying to get, this is a high resolution scanner, but the image is not as high resolution as I can get. Um, and as, as working with the scanner, um, scanner kind of images, I just came across just some, some very graphic um, things that, this was inspired by, some, by a petroglyph um, on the hill that was a spiral. Of course, the spiral is a, is a water symbol and I know that because there was a little depression in the rock which, with the spiral petroglyph that, carried, that collected water. And it was like a communication from the, these ancestors like, oh yeah, the spiral and there's water. Um, so it's just, I call this the Sonoran Desert Mandala. I spent two years collecting all of these things that were just found on the ground. Um, nothing was harmed. No animals were killed or harmed or I'll have to say um, that I did pick one saguaro flower and possibly two, but considering sort of like the almost sacred nature of the Tumamak at the time, I didn't want to pick more than one um, saguaro flower. So I got, I, I did the best I could with um, searching around and just picking one. Again, there's some prints of this in the in the lab building, and they don't always they don't really um, enlarge on the screen much. 
So these are what I learned, like spending a lot of unstructured time on the site, doing a lot of bad work, and don't be afraid of making, you know, a lot of crap. You don't really have to show it to anybody. In fact, I never have to show any of this to somebody. But um, there's a big difference between what you like and making an image that speaks to somebody else. And so for Asher Island, make a lot of mistakes as you make as many as you can, make them early instead of later on. So I, I can't help this, but this is this is what this is this is sort of a this is what I was I started thinking about um, the difference between science and art is is largely objectivity and subjectivity. Uh, what makes something science is, in essence, it's falsifiable. Uh, you could say. It, something is is a cube out in the in the outer world and everyone else agrees yes that's a cube you can't just say like no it's a sphere it's a cube and you can prove that it's you could falsify that and it's subjective it, it exists and everybody can see the same thing whereas art um, humanities music those sorts of things are um, hard to grasp um, one person sees one thing another person might see another thing so it's something that occurs inside of our skin in a way, not just inside of our brains, but inside of our bodies. And there's this little um, tiny little layer of skin and outside of that skin, we don't really know what's out there. We use science to try to identify that. What's inside of our skin is something that we can also use um, maybe some inner science to try to understand and, and understand ourselves. But there's some there's no obvious connection between these two, and there's, there's historical arguments between the two, objective and subjective, subjectivity that um, kind of end up in, in, in to put it really um, simply, objective qualities, um, these ideas of primary qualities were started by Pythagoras and ancient Greeks like centuries and centuries ago, but you can tell that science still works on this. Quantita things that are quantitative, things that are number that can be measured, even though that measurement should have a capital M. Motion, solid things that are solid, that so are solid, you can grab them and you can measure them. They have shape and they take up space. Time might be, might be another sort of thing because you can measure time. Those are considered primary qualities of the world, secondary qualities to these ancient Greeks. And I think this idea is still with us to some degree, are the things that, that the sense perceptions, the things that, that you see with your, with your eye, color, taste, which is spelled wrong. Smell, sound, tactile, you know, and, and sense, the senses. So the real, in rea the real world in this um, in the scientific um, realm, and, and we can discuss all of this, the real world is tasteless, colorless, odorless, silent, it doesn't have any of the qualities necessarily we, in, in the real world. They don't necessarily exist out there. They would only exist within our minds, within our bodies or within our, our senses. So these two ideas, I like to keep in my mind and, keep, and just keep them there and, and not answer any of the questions. And not answering questions just is kind of a good drive. It's a very creative kind of drive for me. Um, letting things that don't at first go together, just holding onto them in your mind and letting them go and then just kind of intuitively feeling your way. Um, basically, feeling your way is exploring a place. So here's what, here's what I started with. When you start um, wanting to make a portrait of a place or understanding a place and how it's different from all other places and how it's the same, you want to learn what people have done in the past. You, and I started to read the old um, articles about early ecologists and some of Forrest Shreve's articles, the, the things that were going on at the time between Clements and, and the scientific arguments, Clements and Shreve. Um, and I came upon this um, word, I came upon this word Humboldtian science, where these people in the early part of the 20th century were, were influenced by something called Humboldt. Um, and he's kind of a forgotten um, person now, 
but I started reading multiple biographies of him and getting more and more drawn in. He was basically an explorer, scientific explorer. And he was, it was said that he was the most famous person in the 1800s besides Napoleon. It was kind of interesting. He and Napoleon were born on the same day. He died in 1859, which I think is the, the, the year that Darwin's Origin of Species was published. And Darwin had um, Humboldt's book called Cosmos. It was a five volume book that was a bestseller. It was science. It was, his book about science was a bestseller worldwide. And Darwin had a copy well marked up, and he said that it inspired him to um, get on the Beagle and start exploring the way Humboldt, you know, lots of people tried to imitate Humboldt. Um, by the way, he was a trained artist besides being a genius. Um, he, this is a self-portrait that he, that he did. Um, obviously, he could draw. And um, this is uh, this is just so. This is just some of the ideas that he wrote about. Um, nature must be experienced via the senses. You can spend all this time collecting data, but then how do you put all that data together? You know, classifying plants and animals. There's there's some um, there's some mixture that you have to have. You have to have some humanities in there and some imagination. You have to have. Um, as, as he would say, you have to have some art um, and some aesthetics. The aesthetics and the, the emotions you feel in nature and uh, the images you get through your subjective body are part of science to him. And the, the idea is um, John Muir was, had, was an imitator of had read Humboldt's book, and that's why he went on his long walks. And that's where he got his idea. Um, John Muir said, everything is hitched to everything else. So in the science of Humboldt, which um, it is old and outdated in some ways, but kind of coming back um, philosophically, everything is connected to everything else. It, it, it's, and the, the reality is more like a web and this also, um, Thoreau also had uh, um, all five volumes of um, Humboldt's book. And it, 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 was a, it was an influence on Emerson and the Transcendentalists among other people. And I'll even get to some more, but um, here's the, um, another one of my mentors, which we just died last um, summer, Milton Glaser, um, a designer who, um, I just was very deeply influenced by this book he wrote called Drawing is Thinking. When you draw an object, the mind becomes deeply and intensely attentive. So in a sense, that's the topic of, um, that's what kind of started me fasc becoming fascinated with the work of some of these scientists. And so um, we, we, have, it's, we have maybe our right eye and we have the left eye when you have two eyes together, you get a completely new view that you can't get with one eye or the other. So I'm just kind of using that like the, um, if science is one eye and the arts and humanities are another eye, they see two different, you can close one and, and close the other, but when you have them together, suddenly they come together in a synergy and everything is three-dimensional, which you wouldn't have even had any concept of 3D if you only just had this one eye. I just have to say um, the, uh, so this is one of, one of uh, I just wanted to go through what, when Humboldt, he explored South America, the Caribbean and, and up into, um, into Mexico as well. And the, when, when he came to a study site, the first thing he would do, he would be doing a drawing. This is his drawing of, um, Taken Dama Falls in Colombia, that was one of his study sites. He'd make a drawing, he'd make every measurement known to science, and he would haul these huge um, packs full of instruments. He, he barometric temperature measurements. He made measurements of the volumes of the falls and the height of the falls. And um, 
he even had a measurement of the that he used to, to, to identify a number to the blue of the sky. And um, he would the third thing he would do is describe the place in his field notes, which were um, generally highly aesthetic kinds of um, almost a way almost very Thoreau like. You could see the the influence that he had on Thoreau. The 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 way he was writing in his field journals was like um, was like prose poem with with this excitement and just sort of this uh, almost like overcome this very emotional you could say kind of recording his subjective viewpoint of the scene. And yet it was subjective in a very, in a very um, measured way. It was almost like objectively looking at his own subjective um, viewpoints on this landscape. And, and he's here, here um, actually I'm gonna read a little bit. I think I'm gonna read a little bit of, from his uh, journal at this falls. I succeeded, but not without danger, in carrying the instruments into the crevice itself at the foot of the cataract. It takes three hours to reach the bottom by a narrow path. A few feeble rays at noon fall at the bottom of the crevice. The solitude of the place, the richness of the vegetation, and the dreadful roar that strikes the ear contribute to render the foot of the cataract of Tekendama one of the wildest scenes that can be found in the Cordilleras. So that's from um, his book with the wonderful title, Researches Concerning the Institutions and Monuments of the Ancient Inhabitants of Some of the Most Striking Scenes in the Cordilleras. So uh, this book was, he was visiting places that were sacred or of interest to the um, indigenous people, which is, this is one of them. Um, so another person influenced by Humboldt was um, Frederick Church, and the rest of the uh, Hudson River School of Artists at that time. So Church on the left here, he went to the same place and he did this um, just like wonderful drawing that led into a painting of these of the Takendema Falls. And he visited a lot of the places that Humboldt wrote about in his notes. And so the one on the right is is not a particular place, but it's inspired by Humboldt's tropical journeys. And um, so here's my little version, my influence of that. Um, um, this, this huge monsoon storm came and engulfed the city. And there was this incredible rainbow. I just ran out. And this is, I took about 24 photographs and um, stitched them together painstakingly to make this image. Maybe there's another one. Yeah, this is another one. Um, being up on the hill, you see these things and you, you just have to be here all the time. And then suddenly some kind of a miraculous sort of thing like this will happen. So the next mentor from the past of only Spalding. He mapped, he was the first uh, visiting researcher to the hill. And I just was, was so, inspired, I just admired him so much, um, just reading through his book. He did this map of every saguaro on the hill. I know that there's 5,800 saguaros in the last um, saguaro, um, saguaro like census that was done. But mapping every saguaro with a plane table and trigonometry, he had a, um, a 1903 or four he had a survey crew helping him. One of the things he did, and he built a fence, you know, just to um, protect the area. And um, he also set up what I call the spalling plots. So, so this visual, the visual of making maps, was really important. And there were visuals, um, which. I can just relate to the visual science. And so I went through looking through the early um, researchers on the hill, like where are their field books? Did they do any drawings or sketches or anything? And the closest I could find were these old field notes, notebooks from um, Volney Spalding. Um, and this is 
this was Spalding plot. I'm not sure which one it is. A number it looks like number 12. And I think he made 19 and I then there's a certain number that were lost. Um, so each of the little dots is the stem of a plant within this um, 10 square meter plot that he set up. Um, and then the words, as you probably well know, Larry, are the, the species of that plant. So they're, they're again like, sort of like, I'm in awe of the, of the attention that's spent and the detail that's, that these early scientists put into just looking at the ground and just kind of, um, it's almost like, um, it's, it's just, maybe it's science, maybe it's not science, maybe it's some kind of art, but it's, it's some kind of like intense attention um, spent on a particular plot of ground um, that I find very similar to the kind of the way an artist becomes absorbed by a place. Um, then as you get to Ray Turner later on, things start getting like actually just sort of beautiful um, visually. Those are the canopies that, that they started measuring the canopies around the little places where the, um, just instead of just the dots. So I don't know if this might, I'm not sure which plot this is, but I spent a lot of time in, in Spalding plot number 10. Um, I went along and during the, there's now a digital media used. I went along and photographed all of the uh, plots tagged along with Ray Turner and the USGS survey crew that, that did the decade um, long measurements. So, so I just watched people measure things. Um, and here's Ray Turner measuring a um, feral cactus in plot number nine, I think. And Ray did some, um, I think, beautiful drawings here. And I might, I just might show like, if you zoom in, and he makes this little note, I just like, just says, there's a large um, Cercidium microfilum semi for short overlaps the plot was it missed in 1978 so like he's he's just paying this this impeccable attention to things um here's one of the um <clears throat> photographs from that from volney spaulding's book and um i became really interested in looking at the we all the photography along with the uh, plotting and the drawing they would take a photograph and of course, Ray Turner started um, doing repeat photography around the hill. And um, let me just pause here for a minute. Does anyone have any questions? Is there anybody there? I miss Ray Turner. Uh, so do I, but um, please ask me some kind of questions or, or comment or something, because I feel like I'm talking to myself. Oh. I, I'm wrapped, so you're not talking to yourself. We are listening very. All right. So there's something. There was something. Um, there was something so um, clear and simple, and I'd say like modest and unpretentious about these early scientific photographs. It was almost could be like a Zen garden where you just have a couple of things, and they weren't trying. They were just, it's like you're standing somewhere and you're just looking. It's not like they were, they weren't trying to make any compositions the way an artist would be. It was very, very un, I'll just say like, unesthetic. We're trying to be objective. We're trying to be, trying not to be art, but trying to be recording of something as detailed as you can. But in a way, accidentally or something, there is kind of a cool composition in here that I could analyze. But mostly, you know, the, the, the sense of space and the sense of you're just, um, it's just ordinary, nothing special. Um, no intention of doing anything aesthetic looking or beautiful. Um, yet there is a certain beauty about it. And so um, I went back to the plot, so I actually, 
I went back, I spent the most time in Spalding Plot 10, which is just down from the lab. Nobody ever goes in there. I knew, you know, it was like exploring unknown territory. Um, and I, I spent time just sitting in there and drawing, maybe doing some photographs and writing. Uh, before that, the artists, there was an artist group that would get together on tour. Mark. Ray Turner took us to some of these, these plots doing a um, project where there was poets coming to, to the hill and writing and there was artists actually doing work on the hill and somebody wrote a poem in standing inside plot number 10 and I just loved that idea and I did some writing and some notes and actually wrote some poems sitting inside plot 10 I just went back there um, but mainly um, and I could, I need to spend a lot more time there because most of that was also like just junk and not usable or not really that interesting. It was so boring. Um, the most interesting that would happen would be like a ground squirrel would come through and, and just, you know, loudly start scolding me for being there or like a bird would fly by or um, there'd be traffic sounds from below. But I tried to pay this attention, like, in, in a meta, it was a meditation or something to see like what was there beyond my own mind or my own conceptions of this place and what I could learn. Um, so I started doing what I, what I took an old camera, <coughs> an old film camera, because I wanted to sort of imitate what some of the old um, scientists were doing. And this is, this is like, um, it has a very shallow depth of field and I was working on things um, really close up. But I, I just noticed that I just really liked shallow depth of field and the focus on just a couple of things. And I thought, I thought, well, it's just rocks and it's just nothing really. And there's nothing of any interest here. And I just kind of liked the fact that there was nothing there, but you could make a composition out of it. And the only thing of interest would be the composition. So I, I worked with that. Um, Photographs of, of in spawning plot 10. So, so the, to me, um, the, all these plants kind of made compositions of sorts, the same way that in um, Ray Turner's drawings of the canopies and the dots, they, they did make kind of a, an interesting and beautiful sort of composition that had an aesthetic quality. But I was trying to make things that had no hero, that there was no, there was really nothing to focus on except just the place and maybe wander around and a, a comp there might be a composition that um, let your eyes, led your eyes around it. Um, but trying to be objective, <coughs> in most cases, these were made out of, um, multiple photographs stitched together as well. So I set it up so that I couldn't tell what I was gonna get as far as the composition until I put it together. So it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of intention, intentionality in making an aesthetic thing here. And uh, of course, hundreds and hundreds of really boring and, and photographs that were really uninteresting and I didn't do anything with them. Um, but this was just one of the little nails that was used to be marking, um, that was used by the earlier scientists to make a grid, which they used for mapping the plot. And it just seemed to have a sort of certain poetry and presence and, and monumental quality to me. And I kind of let the rest of it go blurry like the world is sort of that way, it's just kind of out of focus until you find a little reference point and you find a little data point. And so it's sort of like symbolized to me this little data point in this vast whirlpool of world that you're trying to understand um, had rained and there was water in one of the little um, crevices in the rock. And um, I thought like, this is a hundred years of study in these, in these plots. I wanted to, I sat there kind of wanting to document like 
what happens like within a few minutes or a few hours um, in, in, in other periods of time, shorter periods of time, and like for an artist or a writer might be interested in the things that happen every 10 years or things that happen just every couple of minutes. And the shadows moving across the ground was, was one of those things. Um, even uh, the blurry backgrounds, you could identify the plants, um, the, the choya there, and you could even identify the choya by looking at the, the shadow. Um, so like even those, even those backgrounds, without any detail, they, they just looked Sonoran Desert to me um, because they had the texture or they had that, just even a super out of focus photograph, you, you still know where you are. Um, and there's that, that essential texture of the Sonoran Desert that's intact. So Ray Turner, I met Ray Turner up here. Um, this is him, he, in 2012, he gave one of these um, Tuomak stewards or whatever they called them back then, he gave a talk about the, his work and the, the plots. Um, and, you know, I just loved him and he just took me sort of under his wing because that's the way Ray Turner is. He took me on a, a few of his little field trips around the, um, around the hill. But the way I, I ran into him, um, he remembered me because I had done some work on the hill. I did a little, some illustrations on the hill like in the 90s, but he came up, he lived way across town, but whenever it rained, he would drive up to the hill to make sure that somebody checked the rain gauge. And like there's data from this old rain, 100 year old rain gauge that goes back, I think almost a hundred years. And I just thought, who would do that? Like Ray would do that. He would be that interested in those kind of details and to make sure that there was a rain, that it wasn't a rain that didn't get recorded. And, and he just took such pleasure like in the science that he was doing or in this, whether it was science or whatever it was, I didn't really care, but he took pleasure in just noticing things and paying this attention to like, and measuring them. And I kind of picked up on that sort of enthusiasm. And I think I was on the last field trip that Ray was on. He took me to do a couple of um, re-photographic, um, to re-photograph some things that were due for re-photographing out there on the west side of the hill. And he showed me how he looked at the, the previous photographs, which again, were just like those very, very objective, um, very like maybe the one he's holding, like there, there is something beautiful about that photograph, although it tried its best to not have any artistic aspects. It tried to just make a document of the plants. And uh, funny thing, just funny thing about, um, I think I took, yeah, here's Ray taken through the old view camera. He used the four by five camera, which he used, he used that, which was the same sort of camera that was traditionally used here. Just took this portrait of him. Of course, it was turned upside down because the view camera turns the images upside down. And that's just Ray out there, like trying to decide where, where this, this was done at the camera spot. There's a, um, there was always a place where you take a photograph and do the measurements and make sure that you take exactly the same photograph that the historical photographer had taken. Um, uh, just, I just want to say, I think the very last field trip that Ray ever went on was on the hill here. Um, he had heard that there was an ironwood tree on the ridge, basically outside of the property. On the, on the Tomac, um plant survey, on the, um, there was no, um, no ironwood trees, which is, is a common enough plant. But, uh, you know, if Tulumak is sort of an ark, like a Noah's Ark of the Sonoran Desert, there was a couple of things missing. One of them was the ironwood, and he had heard that there was one on the ridge, Powder House Ridge, across the, um, the wash to the east. So we met up, and we went on a walk up the hill, and sure enough, we found this ironwood tree, took a photograph of it, and Ray just felt so happy. Um, he, it was really important to him to know that there was an ironwood tree and where it was, and that um, it was connected with Tulumak. 
Um, and I just do remember when he was given that slideshow, the, the beginning of the slideshow um, that he gave to the, whatever they call them, they were stewards or um, docents back then. And I was at that slideshow, he said, I'm gonna talk about Tumamak Hill, my favorite place in the world. So I picked that up, picked that up from Ray. And this is a project that I started doing. Um, there was a saguaro that had fallen near the lab's buildings. And this is again, a conglomeration of maybe a dozen photographs taken from a ladder. Um, didn't have drones back then. And I took one every year or so of, as the saguaro degraded. And I, I really kind of need to take another one. It's still a little bit left there, but this is inspired by Ray's um, repeat photography work. Um, it's a documentation of how the saguaro degrades. And yet, um, the first thing I did was just that first image before I even thought of, of re-photographing it. And I just thought there's something aesthetic and beautiful about the way a saguaro is when it's dead, when it falls to the ground. Everything flattens and it kind of relaxes, sinks into the ground a little bit, and um, yet is just so elegant. And, and it's like, Yes, I'm dead, but still I'm beautiful. And I'm slowly going to go back into the ground, but I still have this, um, I'm still kind of standing tall. Or I'm still, I still have this elegant poise. And they do, even, even after they fall into the ground. And every so while that would fall, I would, I would take some portraits of it. The one on the left here is actually a famous so while that fell. And I was up walking the hill when it fell. and I could hear the sound of it. It was like a gun going off. Again, it, it was the one of the um, saguaros that was taken, the saguaro genome specimens were taken from it. So the saguaro genome project number five was out near the, um, just outside the lab. It was a famous saguaro that had an arm. I was the, always considered it a very generous saguaro. It hung one arm down at eye level. And so you could see the, the fruits develop and the, and the flowers And a lot of artists would do um, the drawings, including the drawings of the saguaro flute. On the right, just another um, <coughs> saguaro. When they fall, they, they still have that same um, essence, essential kind of, <coughs> just a little bit different, but it's almost like they're still standing. Well, after I kind of wandered around aimlessly for a while, nobody was up there much on the hill. I, I ran into the snake lady. And there was a project that had started um, with this uh, mad scientist that, that I met and they were collecting snakes, doing surgery, putting uh, radio transmitters into them. So I became fascinated with that. And I spent a lot of time watching them. And they allowed me to um, bring a scanner, the high resolution scanner in there and I started making scans and images of the snakes. This one is uh, three rattlers on Tumamak. It's three species of rattler on Tumamak. And those are the three, the black tail, tiger, and uh, diamondback. Again, uh, I think I might have a zoom in on this. So there's, a, there's an extreme detail that you can capture and um, it might seem like it's uh, kind of easy to photograph things, but I did some studies of the scales based on, on being able to hold or touch the um, snakes when they were anesthetized. And I went to the um, reptile lab at the university and, and looked at others. And, and I did, some draw did a lot of drawings of the geometry um, which was quite complex of the rattlesnake scales. So just so you know, I actually did some drawings um, as well as made digital imagery. Now, the, eventually, eventually I actually kind of had a falling out with these scientists um, because 
I think of, I, eventually he was just sort of annoyed. We had an agreement going that I had these 10 or 15 minutes where I could do something with the snake and they were helping me before the snake would start waking up and they had to take some data. And they were very, very efficient and very time oriented. And I think after a while they got tired of me kind of hanging around um, and, and maybe I was interfering. Maybe eventually I just was in the way and was interfering a little bit. And uh, I kind of stopped doing that. We just sort of, we just sort of parted company. And I was, I was, um, I sure wasn't really happy with the, with the way the interactions, because I wanted to interact with the scientists and kind of share ideas and share data. But um, a couple of the artists that were up here um, drawing together, we found a, a um, we found a gila monster right up by the lab. And it's the first gila monster that's been caught on the lab grounds, on food mark grounds. And I called up Matt, I texted him, and he came right up here and caught it. And he was so excited. I'd never seen him so happy. He's, he's just a very pretty serious guy, very, very intense. And he just said, Paul, we're friends again. You know, I, I was really trying to make kind of make up to sort of make amends with him. And later on, he did tell me, um, and I sort of felt like it ended well. He said, you know, I'd like to get a copy of that snake, the three rattlers on a mock snake um, print that you made. And so in a sense, maybe he understood better what I was trying to do once he had seen the finished kind of work. Um, here's just one of the box of, box of Gila monsters. Um, I could only scan the bottom of this Gila monster because it would not stay on the scanner. So it was in a box. And like the poor thing um, didn't like being in the box, but I, I've got some cool images of it. Um, as like I was saying, other artists were coming up at that time and we would get together and maybe spend two hours drawing around in the grounds and um, then we would show our work and talk about it, kind of a show and tell, very informal. A couple of the people were um, art teachers as like Meredith, who's, who's speaking there. And she kind of gave some really good critiques of people's work, people would talk. And there was, a, there was sort of a nice community um, sense there. And what, one thing that came out of it was this book called, this book of, that came out of, um, the poetry project and the artists working on the hill. And we still have a lot of copies of this somewhere in the, um, in the lab. Um, there was a poetry reading at an art show at Tohono Chul Gallery that, um, this, that came out from the work from this book. Um, and I could again spend a lot of time going over, could I have a whole talk about that project. But one of the things that um, one of the artists said, I wrote down in my journal, in my sketchbook, um, because the show I'm doing here, it just came out of all that. I just went through all my sketchbooks and Richard Schaefer, who was uh, retired from the U of A um, Museum of Art, he says, drawing is an act of affection. So maybe attention, intense attention is also a, an act of affection and you're spending your time, time's a limited quantity, time and attention is something on something outside of yourself. So he was explaining to me like how art and drawing was kind of like love. I just thought about that and I thought there was some little connections there between the between attention and affection. Second thing he said, art, artists naturally want to share their work with others as they do in exhibition. It's like blood, just like food, just like the lifeblood of an artist to share their work. So um, artists working on Tuomak had this idea that they'd share their work and share the sort of visions and the, the act of attention with um, the general population and create actually an, an effect of um, allowing people to experience things in, in maybe a different way. For instance, the walkers. I, did a, I haven't done a lot of photographs of the walkers. That's a whole project waiting to happen, partly because I sort of don't like getting in, it's too personal getting in people's spaces and, and 
photographing them, but um, without permission, but it would be, it's another project that I'd like to do. And what I did is um, eavesdrop on people as I was walking and I made a series of, of found poems from the kind of fragments of conversations that we hear when people were passing me by. And I'm just gonna read one here. This is, was April, it's called April 11th, 2019. And there's five different conversations that I heard on, a, on one walk that day. <clears throat> when I pause, that means it's changing to a different conversation. April 11th, 2019. I'm not giving her any ice cream tonight, the bitch. Now they are back together and they're happy and they're working on themselves. She did make bad choices with her. Uh, she had that boyfriend. And then she got married. I love you so much. Okay, bye. <laughs> so uh, maybe it's just the things that I noticed, but for some reason that day, um, there was a lot of people, people are talking about their relationships. So they're talking about about all these personal things. Um, it's just, and some of the other poems are have completely different things. People are talking about food or, or whatever. They're not talking about the desert that much. People, the things that are in people's minds while they're walking through the desert just became a, a great interest to me. And um, <clears throat> uh, I did. So Paul, this is Trika, can you hear me? Yeah. So yeah, I could hear you. So I. We're getting over I'm, time. I'm just doing my, yeah, I'm just doing my due diligence and duty that we are going over time. And well, we could, I we could end at any point. Love. Well, it's, um, I just want to uh, respect all of the participants that are on here and that are, um, uh, time goes to seven. Yeah. And just uh allow people to realize that we respect if you need to go at this point, totally uh, your choice and your freedom. And Paul will go just a little bit more, Paul, uh, before ending this, well, we, right? We, we could start anywhere and end anywhere. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I kind of lost track of, of the time. Um, just thinking about all this, but I wanted to have kind of a more of a question and answer. And I'm glad that everybody's still there. Um, I could show a few more things. This is part of a Palo Verde project, which is the last, which is a thing that I'm starting, that I'm working on right now, uh, which is photography. I think and, you probably ought to move to Q&A at this point, yeah, just because I, of the time. I'm, I'm good with that. But this is, I'll just end with this. This is a, this is a project that I'm just started doing and that I'm interested in now and I'm gonna start doing over the spring and summer, which is photographs of, of the Palo Verde thickets alongside the road from both sides and the nurse plants that are along the road. So looking at the, um, looking at the mortality of the, okay, interactions or looking at the Palo Verdes themselves and looking at their life, Life well, I could, I could show some of them um, while I'm talking about it. The, I started with just the, the Palo Verde trees and there's always a little cactus underneath them. And um, these thickets became very interesting to me. But the, the nurse plants, um, there's a whole science to the nurse plants, of course, that started on Tuamak. That's what Ray Turner and um, even some of the early Spalding and his wife, Effie Spalding, who was also working here, the first female botanist, talked about how the, they found that cactus would grow under these nurse trees. My interest is in both that, how the trees kind of protect and nurture these, um, this little whole environment underneath the tree, especially the soil cacti. But also that the Palo Verde trees are kind of like protecting and nurturing the people that are walking up the road. So something I haven't quite defined yet, but um, 
there's something about all the trees along the road that have grown up that along that borderline between the sort of like a transect or something or a, a border effect between the desert and the and the road. Um, the trees are in a way kind of nurturing to the people. And I have a whole theory about that, which I, I don't have time to go into, but the next talk, I could give a whole talk just about that. It has to do with Jackson Pollock. <laughs> Indeed. Um, just briefly, I, I started realizing that my photos were, were reminiscent of Jackson Pollock photographs, especially if they were in black and white when you couldn't tell what they were. Um, and I was just working with these textures. And so I looked up, there was a, there was a physicist called um, uh, Richard Taylor who did a lot of research on the fractal nature of Jackson Pollock paintings. And he found that Jackson Pollock paintings have a uh, fractal nature to them that he, he worked um, intuitively worked on to improve. And they reminded me of the um, Palo Verde trees I was taking. I was able to analyze this, the fractal dimension of the photographs I was doing. And but so th th there's there's a, a psychological effect of fractals on, on the human brain and the mm. human emotional system, which if I had the time, I would go back to and connect that back to um, the emotional effects of nature that um, that Humboldt wrote about. Mm. And actually, that's the end of the talk, but I went really quickly through the Palo Verdes. <laughs> and I'll, 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 any other questions like just um, to speak? I, I don't have a question. I'm just in awe of, of the work. And I, I especially love the thinking about, this is Deborah, um, about the plots about the Spalding plots and stuff. Yeah. Um, Those maps made it. Oh, yes. Uh, I know, I, I'm, I knew you would notice that, yes. <laughs> yeah, oh, I noticed that and thinking, oh my God, we missed that? We missed that to Sir City over there? Oh, no, yeah, well, I, yeah, you would notice that, right. right. But um, just an interesting thing, I became just really um, fascinated with these plots and with the, yeah. All the science going around there, and I wanted to explore it in this arts way, but I never showed any of this to any of the scientists. You know, I, I showed them some of the photos of themselves, but I don't know, for some reason I haven't had a chance, or I didn't think they'd be interested, and I don't think they would be. Well, so It's just sort of a personal exploration of a mind that is, that is not really fully baked yet. It's really too bad that Charlotte isn't here. She's the one who's working on the data from the, the new postdoc, who's working on the data from the plots. Mm -hmm. And um, but I think we should um, maybe Larry one time when we have we should we should have you talk to the group that's talking about the data from those plots. Yeah, I actually want to talk with her. I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna look. I'm waiting to for her talk that she's doing a that she's doing a lab talk. But I want to meet her and talk to her because I want to do some things with that data. And, yeah. and a lot of it, I don't understand the, the data science behind it, but I can understand some of, the, um, some, of the, some of the other interesting things that could be done with that. And I, yeah. so I, 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 that's one of the scientists that I'm kind of wanting to meet and interact yeah. with. Well, I love, I mean, your appreciation of the maps and the cover and one of the things that she wants to do is to use those neighborhoods around the individual plants right. to look at the interactions among plants mm -hmm. so we yeah, can yeah. quantify that and and so um it's i love that combination of the aesthetic appreciation of those maps and what you can do with that level of detail that's there that actually hasn't been done yet so yeah, yeah. You can definitely talk to charlotte I like maps, and I did do some uh, animations over time, which I'd like to, to work on some more, of showing the, um, drawing the, the canopies and things as they changed over time. Oh, yeah, yeah, that would be cool. Right. I, I guess that's what my original question was, like, were you looking at the 
um, the life history of those Palo Verdes as you were looking at also just even the nurse plant aspect of them. Because that's sort of interesting because the, the Palo Verdes change so dramatically over time. And so do the swallows as they're coming back or, and other, or other plants, you know, within canopies. And well, people need to focus more on those canopies. I, I would like to learn from the scientists um, more about that, because uh, to, to, to some extent, I was just looking at it just purely visually as, as, as interest, as visual interest and, and compositions and just appreciating it. And the more, the, the, thing, the thing that I, I like to work with is that knowing the science, you can do better art, you can be a better artist. Um, Absolutely. When some of the people, the artists that were coming up here, there were these, these painters that would be doing some really nice work, but I would say uh, they they wouldn't know what the plant was. I would say, um, would you know what that plant is? You know, and they say, no, I just needed that little spot of red for my composition. But I, I always thought, like, if you knew the ecology of that landscape that you're painting, you could be you could do so much better artwork. Yep. But and on the reverse of that, I think is also true. If the scientists could work with artists and start seeing things that maybe aren't taxonomically important, they might also gain some perspectives that um, and make make themselves a better scientist. Will, will the the whole premise of the Tumalak Art and Science drawing course is for is for scientists to learn how to draw when you're drawing. You have this like, incredible openness to observation and, mm -hmm. and memory that, so artists have something to offer. There's a whole tradition of, of drawing that um, ha they can offer to scientists that, that is useful for field notebooks and, and such things. Very useful, it's very practical, useful skills is drawing. Yep, because there's detail that you don't see otherwise. You won't see it unless you really. Yeah. Know. Otherwise, you just see the things that you already sort of have a, a image for a search image for. But you might not see something that's outside of that box. That's right. Yeah, you've got to be able to then expand. I, I very much I, I I don't see things at that detail, and I can't draw, and it would probably be really good for me to <laughs> learn. So I would be able to see that detail more than I do. No, I think you do th see things in detail. But, um, okay. and I also think- um, I see it in numbers. I see it in numbers, not hmm. visually. So maybe you see it a different dimension. If you were to draw it, and it's not true that you can't draw, I challenge <laughs> anybody that, that um, I and the other teachers here at Tumamak Art and Science course, for instance, Barbara, who's over there in Tippecanoe, <laughs> you can draw because we'll show you a kid can draw. And, oh. and the, the drawing that we do is, <laughs> is for your own self. It's for your own, um, it's, it's a development, it's for your own development of your observational brain and nobody judges you. And, uh, but I think you'd be surprised how well you could draw if you just um, learned a few really simple little things. In fact, I'm gonna require you to, to join <laughs> our next, um, the next the fall when we get the class. Oh, I have gotten me. myself into big trouble now. I no, just, just because you said that, um, <laughs> sorry, but you're, okay. you're roped in now. Okay. You may I have so much fun. Oh, it's really fun. Um, I think I think scientists would really have fun, and nobody judges you, mm -hmm. uh, and nobody looks at your work unless you want to show it to each other. But um, everyone's smiling when they're we're, when they're drawing. Mm. Oh, I don't know. I'd be cursing, but never mind. Let's. <laughs> no, I take that as a challenge. I take it as a challenge. whenever someone says that, I always take that as a challenge. Like yes, yes, here. All right. It's a deal, Paul. We'll do it. Well, I am smiling as well, and I feel challenged as well. Um, but I also feel responsible as well uh, for overseeing this amazing 
presentation, Paul. You really inspired us on so many levels. For me, um, it's really helped me equate science and artists, the view of scientists and the view of artists. It's all about seeing at these really deep levels um, and, and details uh, that scientists see and details that artists see are so similar. Um, and, and it's really important that we respect and honor both of those. This has been pretty amazing. And it's really late past the time we usually stop. So yeah. I feel uh, that it is my duty to say, um, here we are at the end of the seven o'clock end, 18 minutes into this. When oh, it's and midnight it really here. Right? Oh yeah, and they're on. Oh wow. Well. <laughs> out in Nova Scotia. Okay. <laughs> um, but so what this tells me is that we really need to pursue this further. And um, I, I think that we will do exactly that with our scientists and artists here. And Tim Lockhill is just the inspiration for all of this. And thank you all for being here. Any last comments or questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Speak up now. Paul, it was great, awesome. And um, that said, I don't see any other uh, comments except for awesome and great, right? Well, well, could you could you save the chat so I can get you know comments from people or any any anything that people were writing? Uh, done awesome. right now. I'll forward that to you. Plus, we are recording this, so we'll make sure. And that said, I just want to point out to everyone that uh, the recordings of the last several uh, Tumamok um, in-service workshops are up on our website. I'll make sure to send that link to you all so you can see any, revisit them, or see any that you missed. Um, Next month, I just want to say that next month our um, uh, in service will be about the study about bobcats on Tumamak Hill, in which a, a team of folks are um, collaring bobcats that are uh, all around the um, western side of Tucson in the tu in the uh, Tucson Mountains. So that'll be a an interesting talk as well, and I sure hope you will all be there. Um, that said, and not seeing any other, except for Alex, we'll get you chilted beans. <laughs> so oh, I yeah, want some of those yeah. chilted beans. <laughs> I, I want those, I want those chilted beans. Um, you got them. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks everyone. Good night all. And we'll see you next month. Uh, thanks. Yeah. We can always Thank reach you, out. Everybody. Thanks Adios. everyone. Nos vemos.